So ever since Brecca was on the Joe Rogan show. It's a genetic test. It looks at um, genetic methylation pathways. So methylation pathways? Methylation pathways. What's that word mean? I've been getting a ton of inquiries about MTHFR and methylation. So I thought I would do a video explaining what this aspect of methylation is, particularly around the MTHFR gene, and also cover some of the other genes because there's quite a few in there, and also go through some of the nuance in methylation because often things are overcomplicated and also oversimplified at the same time. So there's a lot of areas that we can dive deep into. Uh, of course, if you don't have a biochemistry or biology background, some of this is gonna be a bit complicated because we are talking about genes and biochemical pathways. So bear with me as we walk through that, but it's important to understand these things if we're talking about methylation and its role in health overall. Brecca has often made claims that are not necessarily based on facts or science. For example, one of the things that Brecca says at the very beginning of that episode is that methylation is required for us to utilize and absorb pretty much any food and nutrients that we consume, which is completely wrong and I don't understand where he possibly got that from. So we're gonna break down some of the facts and actually look at what methylation really is so that you can understand this in more detail so that you can apply it to your life. So to start, when we're talking about methylation, you know, there's many aspects to it, but usually what people are talking about is this aspect of providing a methyl donor or, or a methyl group, which is really just a carbon atom with three hydrogens. And this is used in a lot of different processes throughout the body. It's used in metabolism. It's used for uh, aspects of our genome. It's used for detoxification, the different areas. And there are, there are other things to consider around methylation, but that's usually the core of what people are talking about. Now to understand methylation, MTHFR, and these types of things, we have to understand a little bit of genetics and alleles and those types of things. So remember, for those of you who've taken Biology 101, I think everyone should remember these. Within our genes, or within our DNA, we have a specific area of genes, and within that coding of DNA, we have four base pairs. Right? We have ATCG, and that codes for specific areas, which then give us the proteins from our DNA. Now those base pairs are really important, and across these base pairs, we can have sometimes mutations. There's different types, but often when we're looking at things like MTHFR and these types of what are called single nucleotide polymorphisms, we're usually talking about something which is a, a point, uh, point mutation. So one base pair has changed within that gene, right? And these are quite common. And so people often misunderstand um, the aspect of looking at a point mutation versus much more significant mutation. So yes, it is a mutation that's occurred at one base pair. However, because they're so common throughout the population, uh, we see them more as uh, polymorphism, meaning that these are frequent and very common throughout the entire population. So we don't see them necessarily as having severe negative consequences. Um, they are just a range of what is normal within, uh, within a population. And so we have this aspect of these polymorphisms, which often lead to different types of what are called alleles. So within a gene, you can have different variants or different types um, of that gene based on the amount of changes of those base pairs, which we would call alleles. And so this is often what we're talking about when we're talking about MTHFR and, and many other genes. And the two most common ones are the uh, 677 and the 1298. It's just a specific area on that MTHFR gene that has some changes. And the uh, 677, most commonly the C677T, which means there's a change from a C to a T on that gene. This is one of the more significant MTHFR polymorphisms that we see, and then there's the A1298C. Now, they're on different areas. The 677 one is m more impactful on how it affects the function of the MTHFR gene. So if you've done MTHFR testing, you might have seen those two variants. Now, within these polymorphisms and these types of alleles across these genes, you can also be homozygous and heterozygous. So heterozygous basically means you have one of the, let's say, changed pairs and one of the good across your chromosomes. If you're homozygous, that means that both of them are changed. And if you're homozygous, it usually means that there's gonna be a more significant effect on that gene. Now, when we look at the distribution of this in the population, there was a study in the Dutch population that looked at how frequent these are, and they showed that the wild type, or the ones with no changes and no mutations, was about 15%. Those who had the A1298C uh, were about 26%. For the heterozygous, for the C677T, heterozygous was about 20%. For the A1298C, homozygous, it was a 9%. For a combination A1298C and C677T, hetero, it was 20%. And for the C677T, homozygous, 9%. 
So we can see that there's quite a broad range of distributions of these polymorphisms throughout the population. So really, it is quite common. So if you have some type of variant of MTHFR, it's not a death sentence like many people would uh, suggest, such as BRCA. Um, it is very common, and thankfully, our body has adapted and evolved ways to be able to deal with this. And we'll cover a couple things looking at nutrition where Often, if we have adequate nutrition and lifestyle, many of these variants don't even really make that much of a difference, if at all. And the other really important thing to consider when we're talking about genes and anything genome-wide is that genes are only part of the picture. They only show us a predisposition towards something. It doesn't necessarily have a deterministic role. It's not written in stone that something is going to change because of the genes. This is the whole aspect of epigenetics, right? So the, the saying goes that the genes load the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. So it's only showing us, as I said, a predisposition, so your chance of having a problem, um, but then we have to consider the aspects of the environment and how those genes are gonna be presenting and functioning in everyday life. And that's where looking at more functional markers are often more important than just looking at genes, especially as a first step. And we're gonna talk about some functional markers that are important to look at if you're concerned about methylation. All right, now to fully understand the methylation cycle and MTHFR, we need to look at the actual pathways. So this is the typical pathway that people are talking about when we're talking about methylation cycles. It's the folate and the methionine cycle. So we can see here through the diet, we get things like folate. We can also supplement folic acid and other items. And there's a very tight interplay between this folate cycle and the methionine cycle. And really the purpose of this cycle is to help produce SAMe, or this methyl donor here, S-adenosyl methionine. And we can see that with other enzymes, this then plays a role in methylation. It, it provides that uh, methyl group to other molecules. So first, looking here, we can see there's a lot of different steps. And this is where, you know, I caution against the oversimplistic view of just focusing on MTHFR and maybe a few other genes. We can see there are many enzymes here which are encoded by genes. Uh, in required to make DHF, THF, 5-MTHF, and then, yeah, 5-MTHF here. So we can see there's lots of steps. This is only one gene in the whole process. But MTHFR sits here, which helps convert 5-10-methylene tetrahydrofolate into 5-methyl-tetrahydrofolate, which then plays a role with vitamin B12 and another enzyme or two enzymes really here to then provide uh, conversion of homocysteine into methionine and then eventually into s adenosyl methionine and then into s adenosyl homocysteine and then that cycle continues. So that's a very important step and again you'll notice that we need B12 as well in this step and we can see here B2 is a cofactor for MTHFR which is really important because we're going to talk about how we can improve the function of this enzyme regardless of what polymorphism you might have. Now you can see there's also a section here where we have choline and betaine that helps also convert s adenosyl homocysteine and homocysteine to methionine. So this pathway is actually an important part as well that we'll discuss and how we can supplement. And again, people are gonna have different polymorphisms in some of the enzymes required for this pathway. And so again, we need to think about the whole picture and not be too uh, reductionist and only focusing on MTHFR. And same down here, you know, if there's backup in the CBS uh, enzyme, then we may see increase in homocysteine. There's a lot of factors that play a role. And to really get that point across, this view here is really a simplistic view of the cycle. Really, we can see it's much more complicated. So here we can see the methylation cycle and we see all the interactions with many other uh, metabolic pathways and many other cycles. So we can't isolate and view methylation just purely by itself. Again, it's too reductionist. There are many interplays. So oversimplifying that just MTHFR is an issue is just too simple. And to really get that point across, we can actually look at this map, which was done uh, years ago, looking at the entire metabolic pathways, right? There is a lot going on inside your cells and inside your bodies. And all of this plays a role and interacts with other systems and other pathways. There's a lot of synergies. There's a lot of dependencies. So really just viewing things in the, in the context of MTHFR and maybe a few other genes that he looks at, I think he looks at maybe five, uh, is overly simplistic and too reductionist. So and it shows the point here of how many things are involved in this pathway and how many different things can really, really play a role and affect methylation and, and what we're doing here. And 
The other thing that I haven't mentioned yet is the role of methylation in detoxification. And so detoxification is obviously a key thing her body needs to perform. And if your body has a high toxic load and a high toxic burden, that will also affect your methylation capacity. As we can see here that in the phase two part of conjugation in your liver for clearing out toxins, medications, other types of things, methylation plays a role here as well. Here as well. So all of these things matter and we need to look at things holistically and consider the, the big picture of what's happening in the methylation cycle itself. Now, as to one of the main roles for methylation, and this is really important because this is going to play into how we address people with MTHFR deficiencies, it's something like 50% of the role of that SAMe is actually to help synthesize creatine, creatine and phosphatidylcholine. And we can actually see in this pathway here where we get the conversion into creatine. So we have creatine down at the bottom. We can see here's S-adenosylmethionine. So that's that SAMe, part of the methylation cycle helps convert arginine and glycine into creatine. And so we need this pathway. And so one thing that we can actually do is utilize supplementing creatine to actually reduce our demand on the methylation cycle. And this actually showed that supplementation can significantly improve um, the outcomes for people with the MTHFR 677T. So that's one way that we can look at things of simply just adding in creatine, 2.5, five grams a day, will help improve your uh, needs for methylation and then allow more function of that enzyme to do other activities. So again, pretty simple approach. We don't need to overcomplicate things. Uh, the other component that I said is the production of phosphatidylcholine. So again, we see here that we have SAM in the use with the PEMT enzyme to create phosphatidylcholine. So making sure we have enough choline and enough phosphatidylcholine can also play a role, but most of it's gonna go towards, towards actually production of creatine more than the phosphatidylcholine and we have other pathways for each of these as well. So those are really big factors and remember we also talked about how B2 is a factor for the MTHFR gene. So when we're talking about treatments and things that we can look at we can actually just utilize increasing B2 in the diet to help the function of that enzyme and research has shown pretty clearly that incorporating additional B2 or having sufficient B2 in the diet helps ameliorate the downsides of having even the 677T polymorphism. And there's been plenty of papers looking at this and even using the proxy marker of homocysteine, we see adding in B2 as riboflavin helps bring down uh, homocysteine itself, in itself, which we can show is likely due to the role in improving that MTHFR gene. So yet again, relatively straightforward and simple approach. Even if you have A1298T, 677T, you know, there are simple things we can do that the research has shown helps improve the function of those enzymes relatively well. So it doesn't need to be a death sentence if you have MTHFR, if you have either polymorphism, um, which is reassuring because there's very straightforward and simple things we can do to actually address it. And as usual, and I say this all the time, you have to be cautious of people who always talk in absolutes or who really only have one tool in their toolbox. So Rekha, for example, you know, he does lots of other things, but he's really big on this methylation stuff. And yes, it plays a role in metabolism and in health, but for the vast majority of people, it's not really what we need to focus on. The basics of lifestyle are usually gonna move the needle the most. And if you have a pretty well-rounded diet, eating nose to tail, then you're usually gonna have enough of the nutrients in your normal diet to help the function of these enzymes, regardless of whether you have one of these mutations or, or polymorphisms. Now, the other thing that we can do when we're trying to improve these pathways, again, if we look back to the other cycle with the betaine that helps move homocysteine, that, yeah, helps move homocysteine to methionine, uh, we can add in betaine or TMG. And so you may have seen this in many areas now, it's quite popular, but we can leverage increasing choline through the diet. So things like, again, liver, uh, egg yolks, fish, those types of things, or just supplementing TMG that will help shift your homocysteine towards methionine without using the folate cycle, without using B9, without using B12, and it will just do it regardless of what you have for your MPHFR gene. So those are easy strategies to start with. Um, looking at creatine, additional choline, maybe TMG, making sure you get enough B vitamins, and of course, additional B12, B2, B9, all of those are gonna help the pathways as well. And as I mentioned, reducing your overall toxic burden so that you can lower the need for methylation going towards detoxifying and conjugating certain things that need to be cleared from the body. 
Now, as far as testing goes, I said at the beginning, there are two different aspects of you know, genetic testing and then functional marker testing. And as I've said, genetics really just shows us a predisposition. It doesn't actually tell us what's going on in the body. So yes, genetics is great to maybe give us insight into where we need to look deeper with functional markers. In the case of methylation, we've got MTHFR that we can obviously look at, but even better is to do you know, whole uh, polymorphism panels. So, and if we're looking at BRCA, he's charging like five, six hundred dollars to look at five genes, when we could spend a couple hundred dollars to look at hundreds of genes on most clinical genetic testing um, labs. So we can look at genetics from that perspective, but keep in mind that that only shows us predisposition, we need to understand the underlying physiology. And that's where the functional markers come in. And so traditionally, a lot of people would look at things like uh, homocysteine, but unfortunately, homocysteine is not the best proxy because there's other things that can affect homocysteine. So if you have, say, elevated inflammation or underlying inflammation in the body, um, that may actually increase homocysteine regardless of what's going on with methylation. So it's a proxy marker, but it's not a great proxy marker. What's better, and a lot of people don't know that we can do this, is actually testing for the specific metabolites on the cycle itself between folate and methionine. So we can look at folate, we can look at the different types of folate, so we can measure you know, tetrahydrofolate, we can measure uh, five methyl tetrahydrofolate, and that will give us more indication as to where your deficiencies are between those steps. So which enzyme is maybe a bit slower, um, and that gives us a lot more indication of what we need to address to support that pathway. And on the meth uh, methionine cycle, we can actually look at uh, things on that side as well. So we can look at methionine, we can look at homocysteine, we can actually look at SAMe and SA as well, which are gonna give us much more direct markers of are we converting that homocysteine back to methionine or not. Right. There's still some nuance there because there's a CBS pathway and there's a few other pathways, but it's a much better indication than just looking at your genes and homocysteine. It doesn't give us uh, as clear a picture. So on the testing side, if it is something you want to look into more, if you're concerned about methylation, I would highly recommend looking at those markers. And of course, this is something that I help my clients with, and I have access to these labs here in Australia, and we can always look to work and find out where you're at with those specific markers. And of course, I'll have the links down there if you do want to work with me. So basically, in closing, my approach to methylation and MTHFR is relatively simple to start. Usually, make sure we're getting the required cofactors and nutrients from the diet and maybe some additional supplementation. That would be things like B2, B9, B12, maybe some additional choline and TMG, and then adding in creatine to reduce the load required on methylation. All right, so that's a starting stack for most people that's going to do the job. If we need to look a little bit further, then sometimes we need to consider uh, adding in, say, a methylated folate or a methylated B12, or maybe even adding in SAMe for some people. But you have to be cautious with adding these in, especially in sensitive individuals, because it can be quite adverse effects. Some people will notice anxiety, they'll notice even psychosis, sleep effects. Uh, irritable mood changes, there can be a host of side effects when adding sometimes these uh, methylated uh, folate B12 or especially SAMe. So be cautious with those. And of course, as I mentioned, we want to reduce the toxic load. So make sure you're covering the main basis of the key pillars of health in reducing toxic load, sleeping well, de-stress, getting some exercise. All of those are going to influence the impact on your methylation cycle and your requirement to support that cycle through other nutrients. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed that video and hopefully that simplified things a little bit for you around MTHFR and methylation. It's a really complicated area. As you saw, there's a lot of different pathways involved here and often there is a lot of uh, misunderstanding and misinformation around the role of methylation and how to address it. But if we keep it simple, we usually get really good results. All right, so I hope you found that helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe so you don't miss out on any future content. And of course, if you want to work with me, you can do so. I work with people across consulting for their health, including methylation, genetics, and a host of other things. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. I'll catch you guys in the next video.